Hi guys, and welcome to this new session of Product with Panache. I'm super excited today um, to be hosting this session with Chloe. Hi, Chloe, how's it going? Hi, Excel. Hi, everyone. It's going great. <laughs> Okay, great. So uh, it's uh, we're both uh, based in France. It's about 7 p.m. here. Um, we are super excited for this session. Uh, we're going to talk about um, Teresa Torres's new book uh, entitled um, Continuous Discovery Habits. We're going to talk about the challenges of product teams around implementing product discovery. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the things we've observed in the book. So Chloe and I were busy uh, this weekend reading the book, which I have to say uh, was really interesting. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and please uh, drop us a note in the YouTube chat. Tell us where you're connecting from. Say hello. And throughout the session, we'll ask you to drop your questions for Teresa, and we will try and get these questions answered as we, as we go. Um, without further ado, I'm going to bring Teresa on stage and uh, please Give her a warm welcome. Drop your notes in the YouTube chat. Hi, Teresa. How's it going? It's going great. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Super. Thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Um, so I have lots of questions for you, and I think uh, Chloe does as well. Um, before we, we go straight in, um, I want to say a few things. So first thing, I want to thank you for the work you've done here. So I've read most of the book now after this weekend. Um, and I, I, as I was saying before, this book is certainly the best handbook I've found and read about product discovery. And I think you've done an amazing job at making it very accessible and easy to read. That's not always the case with business or management books. Um, and before we, we, we dive in, I just want to give the people listening to us today or watching the show um, basically my own review of the book. And then we'll, we'll ask Chloe as well what, what she, she thought about the book. And I hope it will help others in their product discovery practice as well. So the first thing I wanted to say is the book is really well structured with clear sections about what to do and why, what to avoid and what to be vigilant about. I thought that was really, really handy. Um, and I also thought it was a real handbook with very clear examples of how to run activities and what to expect. Um, I like the fact you lose a lot of real life examples of things that have happened to you or fellow product people around the world. I think it helps bring a lot of content into perspective. Uh, I also really think that this book, and I was saying before, combined with Inspired by Marty Kagan, for me, would make the perfect Bible of product management. So um, I'll ask Chloe now to, to say some words uh, on the book, if she has some, and then uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about you, and and I'll ask you to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Axel. Well, to me, this book I, I felt understood by this book as uh, as I was a, a former product manager and then a UX researcher. So I I, I thank you for this because it's it's really necessary to kind of. Uh, state the obvious that it's not that easy to come from uh, output to outcomes and to do kind of product management by the books as we like to call it. So uh, so thank you for this. And it was very, as you said, uh, um, Axel, very straightforward and based with really concrete and practical examples. So that's all the, the gold mine kind of thing that you want when you dig in a book to, to actually see uh, um, concrete example, it feels like you're very connected with product trios, as you say in the book, and you don't just stay in, in, the, in the product probably leadership where you are very connected to reality of what happened in product management. So I really recommend that you read this book because you will feel understood as a product builder, I'm sure. <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much. So um, over to you now, Teresa. Thanks again for taking the time to do this. Why don't you please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and what has, what has driven you to write this book? Yeah, great. Well, first of all, Axel and Chloe, thank you so much for those kind words. My goal with the book um, really was to create an actionable, actionable handbook for product trios. Um, and so I love that it sounds like that, that landed pretty well. Um, so thank you for those kind words. Um, so I work as a product discovery coach. Um, I've been doing that for the last eight years. I work exclusively with product trios, so I work at the team level. Um, I've gotten asked to do a lot of work at the leadership level and, I've, and on the org transformation side, um, but what I really love is um, helping a product trio learn how to be a high-performing 
collaborative team, which forget the discovery side, um, just learning how to be a truly collaborative product trio is hard enough on its own. And then layering onto that, how do we stay really close to our customers um, and make sure that we are infusing as many of our daily decisions with customer input as possible so that we can guarantee that we're creating um, products that both create value for the customer and for our business. Um, and my goal with the book really was just to give teams um, a really clear picture of what good looks like, um, a starting point. So there is no recipe for good discovery, um, but at least give them a starting point where they can start to adopt some new tactics, some new methods, um, and then kind of evolve it from there. And I'm really excited to see what people do with it and how they do evolve it and how we keep pushing the practice of discovery forward. Amazing. Was there, I'm very curious, was there like a, a flipping moment where you said, okay, now based on my X years of, you know, training, advising and coaching these teams, I'm going to put all of this in writing or how, how did, how did it happen? Yeah. So I actually made the mistake of announcing in 2016 that I was going to write a book. So, <laughs> so here we are five years later and the book is finally coming out. So what happened in 2016 was, um, in early 2016, I was working with a product team um, and they gave me some feedback. They said, Teresa, you're teaching us a lot of good tactics, um, but we don't know what to do when. Um, and that was really eye-opening to me because one of my key principles as a coach is I want to get a team to be self-sufficient um, and running on their own as quickly as possible. So I don't want a dependency upon me. Um, and so that really led to me thinking about how am I making decisions about what to do when and how can I better guide this team? And coming out of that work was the, um, I basically came up with the opportunity solution tree. Um, and I started using it in my coaching practice and it was really powerful. It had a really big impact on how teams were doing work. It helped a ton with um, just team alignment and then really helping with this problem of how do you know what to do when. And for listeners that aren't familiar with the opportunity solution tree, it's just a visual that helps you chart your best path to your desired outcome. And the visual nature of it is what really helps with that team alignment. And it gives you visual feedback of, of where you might have a gap in your discovery process. And so I knew at that time that it was a powerful enough tool that I wanted to get it into a lot of people's hands. And so I announced naively that I was going to write a book. Um, and so I actually tried to write a book in 2016. And actually, as a product manager, I hated the process of writing a book because it's a it's a it's a, a the epitome of the waterfall process, right? You spend a yes. lot of time by yourself putting words on paper, <laughs> and then you release it in the world and you hope that it's good. And I didn't really want to do that, and so I took a step back and said, "How can I test the ideas that I want to put in this book?" And that mm. led that led to me being really um, taking a product manager mindset to my coaching curriculum. So how can I codify my coaching curriculum in a way that I can test it and run cohorts through it? Um, and that's what, I, that's what I've been doing for the last five years. So I work with sets of teams in coaching. I also have a number of courses through the Product Tech Academy that has allowed me to test this content. Um, and it really was in the last um, year and a half, about a year and a half ago in December of 2019, um, I really started, started to feel like, okay, the data is starting to show. It's time to put this in the book. Well, it really Brilliant. reflects. It really reflects it in a book, uh, as we said earlier. Like it really feels very connected, deeply rooted in reality, and it makes it to me a, a great handbook to kind of keep through your career as a product manager. Brilliant. Um, before we uh, delve into the ins and outs of uh, continuous discovery, I think um, there's a foundational uh, thing we need to address, um, which is really the relation between our role as part of a product trio, making product decisions every day, uh, and the interactions we have with customers or end users. So what I'm talking about is, you know, this relationship there is between making product decisions and talking to end users. Can you please clarify why, from your point of view, it is important that teams adopt this continuous discovery habit? Yeah, it's really simple. So when we work on a product team, we spend all day every day talking about our product, right? We're talking to our sales reps about what features are missing. We're talking to our CEO about longer term vision for the product. We're talking to our um, support teams about kind of what bugs and challenges customers are having, but it's all very product centric. And the challenge with that is that we know our products better than any customer possibly could. And we start to fall prey to a bias called the curse of knowledge. Right, where we understand the underlying model, data model, we understand the interface, everything seems easy for us. 
We know exactly what goes where. Our customers don't have this luxury, right? And so what happens over time if we don't spend time with our customers is that we fall more and more prey to that curse of knowledge bias. And we start to build a product that's hard for our customers to understand. It doesn't quite reflect um, their world and how they want to use it. Um, and the example that I give for this a lot is that if you look at your mobile phone, and I'm sure everybody has one within arm's reach, you probably have dozens of apps on your phone that you were really excited about at one point. You downloaded it, and then as you used it, it didn't quite work the way that you expected it to, right? And that could be anything. It could be a clunky interface. It could be it was missing a key feature. It could be the workflow just didn't match the way that your brain worked. And we see this like day after day, week after week, that products just fall short. And a lot of that is not, like it's easy to think, oh, that team's just not very smart, or they must not be a very good company. The reality is most people working in product are really smart, capable people. They care about their customers. They're just not spending enough time with them to make sure that those teeny tiny daily decisions are the right ones. Mm. I just had one quick question, um, just bouncing from this topic. I, I found it very challenging as a product manager, designer, engineer to do this kind of research and interviews without any bias because, because we, we have this, like, we decide what's the, what's the overall result of all this study. How, how do you manage to cope with all those biases and kind of keep this fresh eye and, and fresh ear, I would say, as you listen to customers? Yeah, this is exactly what makes discovery hard, is the human brain just gets in the way, right? So there's a number of biases that come into play. One is the escalation of commitment is a really big bias that comes into play, which is basically this. The more we invest in an idea, the more we fall in love with the idea. The more we identify with the idea, the harder it is to see the flaws. This is really closely coupled with confirmation bias, which is as we test an idea, we're much more likely to see the confirming evidence than the disconfirming evidence. But we also see the curse of knowledge come up. We also see biases related to sort of group dynamics and um, come up. And so really my goal in working with teams and developing these practices is how do we um, create practices that help us overcome our limitations given that we all have human brains. Um, and, and a lot of this comes up in the research that we do, right? So a lot of people in the industry that are doing research, we learned it in industry. What I mean by that is we don't have academic backgrounds in research. And so we don't always have some of the like fundamental research concepts of understanding what leads to reliable and valid research. Yeah. So one of, another one of my goals is how do we start to introduce some of those ideas in a way that doesn't lead to us doing large, long scale academic research. Like we just don't have time yeah. for that, right? We really need to do fast research. The good news is, is unlike in the academic world, we have really fast feedback cycles. So the other thing I tried to do in this, in this book is really introduce research methods that will help us collect reliable and valid feedback, but on a timeline that works for product teams. Brilliant. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive in a little bit further in the book now. Um, I've, so I kind of picked some of the so some things that I found were really interesting and um, were relevant to maybe some of my experience and some of the things I've I've seen and I've I've been through before, and I think it'd be good to share this with a wider community. In chapter three of the book, for example, um, you discuss focusing on outcomes instead of outputs, and I think you know we've heard this for for a while now, and I think it's a very strong idea that's starting to at last emerge in the in, in the management uh, world as well. For me, there are two major traits of failing organizations that I've you know witnessed. The first one is the lack of empowerment. Um, and the second one is exactly this, organizations focusing on outputs instead of outcomes, right? And I found the example you take from uh, Sonia at Tales.com very relatable. You mention shifting to an outcomes mindset is not as simple as choosing a metric and running with it. Teams starts with a new outcome often have no idea how to measure that outcome, how to impact it, or even if it's the right outcome to be pursuing. And in a conversation I had recently with you on the Continuous Discovery Habits Masterclass, you mentioned that you prefer working with product teams rather than leadership teams. And we talked about that in the intro as well. <laughs> How do you manage environments where there's poor product leadership, essentially, where teams are not very empowered? Yeah, so I'll start by saying there's a lot of work to be done at the organizational level and the leadership level. So when I say that I prefer to work with teams, I'm not saying that work isn't important. It's critically important, and it's actually 
really hard work, and I'm really happy to yeah. see that Marty mm-hmm. Kagan came out with Empowered and then started is starting to Marty Kagan and Chris Jones came out with Empowered and is starting to work at that level. Petra um, uh, Villa has a phenomenal book, Strong Product People, that's really aimed towards um, product leaders. So I don't want to. I'm not trying to underemphasize that level. I actually think it might be our biggest bottleneck right now. Correct. Um, <laughs> I choose to work at the team level because it's really fun for me. I love yeah. working with people on the ground building products. I feel like we still have a lot of work to do there. Um, and those folks are really eager to learn, which makes them really fun to work with. So that's the first thing <laughs> that I'll say is that it's not because I don't think the other stuff is important. Um, yeah. uh, I do think, so there's this sort of like b- naive belief that like, oh, well, we've, we've always had KPIs. So if we just pick a number, we can just tell this team, drive this outcome and you'll be, you'll be empowered and you'll go do your work. It's a little bit more complicated than that for a couple of reasons. So first of all, organizations are in the middle of transformations. We talk about digital transformations, which really is just trying to wrap your head around this product-led mindset, um, di- leading with digital products. But there's more to it than that. Like there's this fundamental mindset shift. And I get into this a little bit in the book at the team level, but the same mindset shifts need to happen at the leadership and organizational level where we have to let go of this idea that we can predict the future. Right, and a lot of business is set up around predicting the future. We, we come up with five-year strategic plans. We do annual budgeting. We pick projects and initiatives that we're gonna focus on for the year. We come up with 12-month roadmaps. All of this assumes that today, we can forecast and predict what we should be working on six months from now, nine months from now, a year from now, three years from now. And the reality is, is the world is always changing. And we got a big dose of that in 2020. Right, the world saw a massive Correct. change in 2020. <laughs> now, hopefully, we don't face a global pandemic very often in our lifetimes. Let's cross our fingers. Um, but it doesn't have to be a global pandemic. It could be a new competitor in your market. It could be a new technology dis- that disrupts what you're doing. It could be a shift in your consumer's mindsets. Um, so there's lots of things that can um, have an impact that could change the landscape for you. And so, if we stick rigidly to a plan. Um, we're going to miss the opportunities to react to those changes. So that's the first piece. And like we're seeing um, businesses and organizations and leaders um, starting to accept the fact that, hey, the world is changing quickly. The internet has completely changed the pace at which competition happens. Um, And that really, we need to be a a lot more adaptable. And that's why we're seeing everybody talk about agile. But the reality is we only kind of get it. We don't really know what this looks like in practice. It's still a hard mindset change. And so yeah. we think like, oh, we'll just say you're empowered and it will work out fine. <laughs> Whereas in reality, like every step of the way, like we pull them back into this mm-hmm. future. It's a daily struggle, control, right? Yeah. Right? And then, and then um, Axel, I think what you were getting into is there's sort of this skill involved in setting an outcome. And we see this in Sonia's story in the book and that they, they set out to um, focus on an outcome like 90 day retention. And they realized like 90 day retention is kind of a terrible metric because they have to wait 90 days to see the impact on that goal, on that metric, right? So they make some product changes and they don't really know if they had an impact until 90 days later. And so that story is just uh, the story of like how they continue to evolve that outcome to make it more actionable, to make it more meaningful, but have it still tied to the business outcome that mattered, which was 90 day retention. And that's one of the reasons why I teach a continuous process is that we're continuously learning. We're continuously learning how to measure things And if that outcome isn't continuously evolving, just like everything else, it's gonna get stale and you're gonna be optimizing the wrong metric. Um, What's hard about all of this is that until you start to see what a good continuous process looks like, it takes this leap of faith because it's so fundamentally different from how we've worked in the past. And and it's it's to to some extent, it's, it's humane, right? Because you know what you get from your current methodology of doing whatever you're doing now, but you don't know what you get with this new thing that you that you're going to try, right? Yeah. So you kind of have to take this leap of faith. I completely agree. Um, and I guess my follow-up question would be, you know, what advice would you give to the people in these teams that maybe are struggling to get this point across that you know we have to do things differently. We have to we have to do product discovery. Let's not even talk about continuous discovery. We have to do some discovery, mm-hmm. right? Um, what, what advice would you give to, to these people in these product trios? Yeah, so at the end of the book, you may not have gotten there yet. There is a chapter 
That's all about, okay, so I read this book. It sounds great, but this is nothing like what my organization looks like. In fact, I open every, every chapter with a quote, and the quote in that chapter is, yeah. uh, but this isn't how my company works, and it's attributed to you, the reader. So I feel your pain. <laughs> the vast majority of product people do not have the luxury of working in an organization that works this way. But that chapter is chock full of tips of how can you get started, right? And the big, the big idea in that chapter is this. You have a lot more agency and the ability to impact the way that you work today than you think, right? So you don't have to wait for permission. Um, there's a lot of things that you can get started today. And I know this because this was my full-time employee experience. So I worked in organizations where I never had a head of product say, go talk to a customer every week. I just did it, right? And I often got a lot of pushback, right? I would run experiments and I would have um, like a VP of business development or um, a head of sales come to me and be like, why aren't you just building this feature? Um, so I've been in those shoes. I know what that is like. And even in those really tough contexts, you will still be a better product person, whether you're a product manager, a designer, or an engineer, if you infuse more of your process with feedback from customers. And there is a way to do it regardless of your organizational context. So the key that I encourage um, people to do as they read the book is to let go a little bit of that mindset of this will never work in my organization and flip it on its head and say, how might this work in my organization? Because you have a lot more agency and a lot more ability to influence change than you realize. I really like also this, this part of your title that says habits. And habits, yeah. it, it takes a while to, to switch habits, a month, some would say, or a few weeks. So it's, it's hard at the beginning to get the new habit going and kind of, yeah, it, it creates very a lot of uncertainty, but also you, you feel like even your own body is kind of resisting this. And um, in, in previous, um, when I was working at Manomeno, I used to compare research to going to the gym, right? Yeah. So if you don't have like a this, this precise appointment or if, if the coach is not coming to you, then it's hard, you know, the hardest is actually to take your bag and just go. It's not once you're there, it's just take your bag and go. And so I used to flip this and kind of book Uh, directly in the calendar of product managers uh, appointments with users and saying, you'll find then it, what you have to say to them. I'm pretty sure you'll take the opportunity, but now it's scheduled and it's in your, it, it's in your agenda. And, and I really like the fact that you, you, you help us in the book train for this new habit to kind of um, forge and grow into us. And it takes, it takes days, weeks, and eventually months. And then probably we won't go back afterwards. Yeah, it's really easy. Here's what I'll say. It's really easy to read this book and be like, wow, there's a lot here. There's no way I'm going to adopt all of these habits. <laughs> what I like to encourage people to think about is take a continuous improvement mindset to adopting the habits, right? Mm -hmm. So just start somewhere. How do you make next week look a little bit better than last week? And if you just keep doing that, this exercise analogy is spot on, right? It is just <laughs> like exercising, just like trying to eat healthier. Like if you just tomorrow try to radically change your diet and you go to the gym every day for a week, You're going to give up. It's too much change all at once, right? So maybe you start with what do you eat for breakfast? So in the book, I really talk about the habit to start with is just talk to your customers more often. Forget all the other things. Don't even worry about testing assumptions. Don't worry about outcomes. Just until you're talking to customers regularly, just think about how do I talk to a customer next week? It could be a five-minute conversation. It could be sitting in on a sales call. And just how do you start to increase the frequency at which you're exposed to your customers And then once that's a habit, you can start to pick off what's the next habit. And that's actually why I wrote the book where it's essentially a habit, a chapter. And it's so that, you know, I, I do encourage you to read the book end to end so you get the big picture of what does this look like in practice. But from there, you really could work, with, work on one chapter at a time as you just start to really build and develop that habit. Mm. Um, another question that I had is, I really like the fact that you said, Um, in, in the third chapter, uh, be careful with why question to your manager because uh, he or she might switch to a defensive mode. And I really like this because um, I feel like it's, it's so true. Um, we can't really say with like this kind of naive, kind of childish uh, pause to just ask why and why and why question to our, to our product leaders just because they feel like you're doubting their leadership, even if you're not. So can you elaborate a bit on this thought and how can we actually ask a why question to our leader without doubting them? Yeah, this is a really great question. So in the book, I talk about when you're setting an outcome in an ideal world, it should be a two-way negotiation 
between your product leader, and by that I mean your chief product officer, your VP of product, maybe your GM of your business unit, if that's who is setting your outcomes, um, and the product trio, so the product manager, the designer, and the tech lead. And I know this is not how it works in a lot of organizations, so at the end of the chapter, I try to give guidance based on, based on how you're setting outcomes today, here's how you can start to shift that. And in that advice, I talk about if, for example, your leader isn't giving the strategic context of why this outcome matters, you can start to ask for that. But you don't want to say like, hey, why do you need me to focus on reducing churn? Because you can put the leader on the defensive and then that's not going to be a fruitful conversation. What you can do is just express curiosity, right? So uh, I'm curious, tell me a little bit about like, um, what, where are we seeing churn um, create a problem in the organization? Or um, give me a little bit more context. Like, it looks like our churn has been pretty consistent. Why is it so important in this moment in time? So like, why is it, if it, it's important now, did something change that led it to it being our biggest priority right now versus last quarter, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of fishing for, give me the context for in which this outcome lives, but you want to do it in a way that encourages your um, leader mm -hmm. to share more rather than putting them on the defensive of like, I don't want to do that outcome. Why are we doing this? It needs to be more of like from a position of curiosity. Um, and then it also can really help with helping you develop your across the business perspective. So this is something that I think people that have only worked in one functional role um, struggle with, right? So it's easy as a UX or a product person or even as an engineer to like hyper focus on the product and like what's best for the product or what's best for the customer. And we sometimes forget about, like we, out, we also have to create value for the business and we don't always develop that cross across the business perspective. So we might do something less optimal for the customer um, because it's gonna bring in a short-term win for the business. And that's not always bad, right? We wanna resolve that tension and make sure that we're, we're serving both the customer and the business. Um, and developing that sort of across the business view will help you make better decisions about how to balance both. Super interesting. Um, I guess what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take some uh, questions from the guys in the YouTube chat. Um, super interesting to see. We've got um, people uh, joining us from uh, Boston, from Brussels, Australia, Switzerland, Denmark, uh, Brazil. So I'm going to take some of these questions now. Uh, I've got Dan here uh, asking, how do you infuse the discovery mindset to the culture of a company where most decisions are feature factory oriented yeah so first of all i want to shout out to the peep person from boston because the boston bruins won their series last night uh, so that's <laughs> awesome uh, um okay so yeah how do you infuse um discover a discovery mindset into a feature factory culture so um i teach a master class where um actually axel's in the current cohort where people come from all different companies and this is a really different environment for my coaching so when i coach a team their head of product brought me in, right? So already the organization is supporting discovery in some ways. Whereas in my masterclass, just individuals in all sorts of organizational contexts show up and, are, and then it raises all these questions of like, hey, my company doesn't work this way at all. How in the world do we do this? So I've been thinking a lot about this and here's my takeaway on this. Even if nothing in your organization changes, right? So you're always being given a fixed roadmap with outputs, with dates next to them, and you literally are working in this feature factory model, you individually will still benefit from developing an outcome mindset and talking to customers and starting to understand the opportunity space because you will build better versions of those outputs that are being dictated to you. So even if nothing, and this is why I really um, suggest that teams focus on what's in their personal span of control and let go of the organizational change challenge. Mm. Because unless you're ahead of product, you're gonna have a really hard time um, changing your organization by, by fighting the ideological war. Now, here's what I will say. If you start to develop your own outcome mindset and get an understanding of the opportunity space and you build better versions of those outputs, those outputs are gonna be more successful and people in your organization are gonna get curious about how are you improving? How are you getting such better results? And then that's where you're gonna be in a much better position to show what you're doing differently. And showing is always a better way of influencing than kind of telling and bringing that ideological war. So I would say, let go of the organizational change piece and just focus on 
what your, you and your individual trio are doing and work to put as many of these habits into practice. And what's going to happen is your organization is going to get curious about how you're working and you're going to be in a much better um, position to influence. And I guess there's also this idea of, um, how would I put it? It's almost like, you know, uh, don't, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. I think we go back to yeah. this idea as well, right? And um, in, in the chapter five of the book, so we'll talk a little bit about continuous interviewing now. Um, you share a lot of very hands-on advice and content around how to interview regularly um, and, you know, what's the best practice, et cetera. And I'd like to talk about what is, in my experience, the most common objection uh, fellow product trio members have had from their stakeholders regarding this idea of embedding product discovery uh, as a practice within the product management organization. Um, and a lot of these heads of products or product leads will be saying, well, if we do discovery, then it means we'll, we're doing less of delivery, right? Like if you want to do more of this thing, then we have to do less of this other thing. Um, and of course that can't happen because, uh, and I like uh, how um, Melissa Perry talks about this, like, you know, once you've uh, kind of started the product delivery engine, it's very hard to stop it, right? So for all the product trio members listening, how would you handle that objection and what advice would you have for them? Yeah, so this is the key to continuous interviewing. So if you, let's say that you, your idea of interviewing is this project mindset of interviewing, which is mm. in a typical project, we interview six to 12 people. It takes weeks to recruit them. It takes weeks to conduct all the interviews. We then do like this affinity diagramming or affinity mapping exercise where we look at key insights and we have to create a research report and then nobody reads it. And what happens in that project world is that it takes, we think about interviewing as this big project that takes a long time. I want to be really clear, I am not dissing project research. There are long horizon, bigger strategic questions that do need project research. And if you work with a centralized user research team that is doing that research, leverage it. That is awesome. So there is a place, a time and a place for project research. However, product trios don't have time for big project research. We don't. Right? This is where we're going to be consumed by delivery. And this is why I teach a continuous interviewing process. What does that mean? Talk to at least one customer every week. So you're not, and, and the key to this cadence is to automate your recruiting process. So you're showing up on Monday morning. You have a 30 minute conversation with a customer on your calendar. You have to do nothing to get there um, and nothing to get it there. And you're just, it's easier to do an interview than to not do an interview. It will take work to automate your recruiting process. You're going to have to experiment. There's ideas in the book for how to do that. We cover even more ideas in our continuous interviewing course. So if one of the three methods in the book doesn't work for you, um, reach out. We have lots of other methods. But here's the key. Even in your busiest week, your release went wrong. You have an upset customer. You do have time to conduct a 30-minute interview, right? So the, the goal to making discovery continuous, even though you're probably double and triple booked, is to do teeny tiny research activities. And what do I mean by that? That could literally be one 20 minute interview every week. And the reason why this is so powerful is when you talk to your customers every week, you start to realize your mental model of how your product work, it works is different from how your customer's mental model of how your product works. And then that reminds you like, hey, we probably should test this idea or we should probably prototype this or maybe we should test this assumption, right? So that one 20 minute meeting is a keystone habit that's gonna unlock the other behaviors. It's just gonna become obvious and you're gonna to start to see um, it's gonna cost you more time in the end if you don't do those things. And then I have met some teams where even adding a 30 minute meeting, like they literally do not have room in their calendar because they're in meetings 10 hours a day. So what I would recommend is literally print out your calendar, find a red pen and start Xing out meetings. You do not need to be in all of those meetings. I don't even need to know anything about your company or your corporate culture. I can guarantee you don't need to be in all of those meetings. And the reason why you are is because it makes you feel important and it feeds your ego a little bit, right? So it, we have to first do the work of looking at our calendar and saying, which of these meetings can I get out of and stop going? And don't be afraid to rock the boat a little bit. Um, test the waters. What happens if you don't go this week? I mean, and here's the reality. Like you could have been sick that day and not gone that week and they would have figured it out. So, the, world go, the world goes on. <laughs> yeah. So if you really are booked 10 hours a day, the first step is get out of those meetings. You do not need to be in most of them. Correct. Um, thanks. Thanks so much for that. Um, 
Chloe, did you want to uh, did you want to uh, jump on something here? Yeah, yeah, I had a couple questions on this uh, on this chapter five. First was, um, I wonder if the ratio about delivery discovery is kind of similar to each member of the product trio, um, because when I was kind of doing all those small interviews back then, I I had some friction with engineers that didn't really want to go or quite didn't know how or felt like they were not um, supposed to be here. They, they would like to watch, but not intervene, or what do you think? Yeah, there's a couple of things happening here. So first of all, all humans are afraid of the unknown, right? Mm -hmm. So if I go to an engineer and I say, hey, do you want to come be part of our discovery? And they don't know what that means. They're immediately uncomfortable, right? We're, we're, make, we're putting them in a position where they're going to feel like they're missing expertise. And so we need a better onboarding process for somebody who is new to discovery. Just like we onboard first-time customers, we need to onboard first-time discovery members, right? So we need to help them be comfortable. We don't want to throw them in and be like, okay, you conduct the interview. We can start with, just come observe. And then we can move on to, okay, how about help notate, note, take notes. And then we can move on to help us come up with the right questions to ask. And then we can move on to, let's practice with each other so you can practice interviewing. And then eventually they interview a customer, right? So there's, there's ways to onboard people to these skills without just throwing them into the deep end. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is with engineers in particular, we have spent decades training engineers that their value is to write code and that we don't want them to have an opinion about what to build. And so they don't believe us when we say, come participate in discovery and you get to help make decisions about what to build. Because for literally decades, we've told them, these are your requirements, just go be an order taker. And so we have a lot of trust we need to rebuild. Right? So that's the second factor that's coming in there is that like, we got we to gotta build that bridge. We got to help them see that if they do participate in discovery, um, we, they will actually get to influence what we build. And then the third thing is because of that first and second thing, we do have a lot of engineers um, that really do want to write code all day. Um, and they really don't want to talk to customers and they don't want to be involved in this. <laughs> and so I've heard some engineers literally say like, no, I'm an engineer because I'm an introvert and I just want to sit at my computer all day and write code. And so here's what I would say in that instance. I have met many engineers who don't want to be part of discovery, but I have never met an engineer who doesn't want to have an opinion about what they build. And so you have to connect the dots between those two things. We are going to make decisions about what to build based on what we learn from our customers. And so if you want to have an opinion about what we're building, you need to have first-hand exposure to the customer and be a part of the discovery process. Thank you. That's a very powerful last sentence. I really like it. And I'm going to quote you on this one. Um, I, th I think so. this is going to end up being a poster somewhere, you know, like if you, <laughs> exactly. want, to, if you want to have an opinion, you have to be part of product you, discovery. So. Yeah, I, I, I feel like this will kind of limit the number of interactions with most people in the company. Um, the last question I had on this chapter particularly is that um, I really like the fact that you started the chapter with the two quotes that I've heard the most, um, one from, from Ford um, and one from Steve Jobs. And, and it's for, for the people that are watching us, it's like people don't know what they want until uh, you show it to them. Or if, if Ford would have listened to people, he would have bred faster horses instead of producing cars. And I see how product people miss this point in research or product leaders. It's like they ask the customer to give them answers on what to build rather than to describe precisely their problem. How would you help a product trios to only extract desires and needs from interviews and not kind of switch to solutions and, and in, in, in interviews particularly? Yeah, so this was fun because I people often quote Henry Ford and say if I'd asked them what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And then inevitably somebody in the room said, but Henry Ford never said that. And then it becomes this like really pedantic debate. And so I actually opened the chapter with Steve Jobs using that Henry Ford quote, which got me out of that quagmire altogether, which I loved. Um, so Steve Jobs did also say, we, um, I don't believe in market research. Customers don't know what they want um, until we show it to them. Okay, so this is um, kind of a landmine for us in the discovery world because Steve Jobs is obviously this icon and he built amazing products. So let's unravel this a little bit. Apple is exceptionally good at discovery. 
And what Steve Jobs meant by that, he did not He did not mean, I guarantee this, and if you listen to other things that he said, it's clear that he did not mean we don't have to do the work to understand our customers, to understand their context, to understand their needs. In fact, I would argue that the Steve Jobs, like the Apple led by Steve Jobs is one of the best examples that we have of companies uncovering unmet needs and then, deli and then meeting them in ways better than anybody else. We saw this with the iPod. There were plenty of MP3 players out in the world. They were hard to use. Um, you had to manage a ton of things. They didn't have a lot of storage space. They were not very useful. And then I, Steve Jobs came out and said 10,000 songs in your pocket. Like he went exactly after the need of, I want to listen to music all day long. I want it to be easy to get my music on the device. I need battery power that lasts all day. And he solved it, right? And that was a crazy successful product. Here's the thing that people misunderstand about interviews. I never in an interview want you to ask a customer, what do you need? What do you want? Does this solution work for you? Customers don't even know what they need a lot of the time. A lot of our needs are latent. We're not aware of them. And that's why in the book I teach, your goal in an interview is not to ask people what they want. You can't even ask them about their pain points because oftentimes anybody who's ran a usability study can see that people are not aware of their pain points. Because you observe someone using their product, they have a ton of problems with it, and at the end you ask them how did that go and they go, oh, it was fine. And it's because they're not even aware of the problems that they're having, right? And so the key to uncovering reliable opportunities in your interviews is just to collect specific stories. So I'm not gonna say, Chloe, what problems do you have with Netflix? You might be able to come up with one or two things, but you're not, gonna, you're not even aware of all the little teeny tiny things that happen all the time, right? Whereas if I ask you to walk me through the last time you watched Netflix, all those needs and pain points are gonna emerge from that story. So that chapter about interviewing is really all about how do we collect specific stories so that we can see the needs and pain points and desires that are emerging from those stories. Because sometimes they don't even come to our, we're not even aware of them. And that's when products surprise us and delight us is they address needs that we didn't even know we had. Thank you, that's very cute. Collect stories and interview. I really like this line too, thank you. It's all in the book. We, we like this book is seriously, I have to say it again. This book is just pure gold. Um, I'm moving a little bit ahead here and I can, and I'll pick some questions from the YouTube chat, um, just after uh, this question. Um, something really, really kind of stuck with me, uh, in chapter nine of the book where you talk about, uh, this housing project in Portland, Oregon, where, where you're based, um, which didn't have the impact the city council expected because they never tested the assumptions they had about why this project might work and what the potential buyers were after. The, the following section in the book is entitled, Be Prepared to Be Wrong, and goes on to explain how to test assumptions at base while avoiding confirmation bias and escalation of commitment. And this actually brought me to something I've been through very recently. Um, I often encounter product line managers that you know, will argue that product discovery can only be led by technical experts. For example, if you work in a technical environment, say like payments, some will say that you need to be a payments expert to be able to run product discovery in the payment space. To what extent do you think product managers in these technical environments can be vulnerable to their own biases? And do you think non-experts can be good at product discovery? Yeah, this is where that cursive knowledge is going to come in, right? So cursive knowledge is a really important bias for product teams to be really aware of. Because let's say that you're on a payments team and you have no expertise in payments. And so you're coming in with fresh eyes, which is nice. And you're going to, you're going to learn things and you're going to see gaps with existing payment problems that a more mature, experienced payment, um, product manager might not see. But here's what's going to happen. After five or six interviews, you're going to start to hear some patterns and you're going to start to feel like, oh, I get it. Right? So it's not about how much experience do you have. Because even if you have a fresh start, you're going to have experience pretty quickly with continuous interviewing. Even if you have a decade of domain expertise in payments or you're brand new, both people need to cultivate this mindset of no matter how much I know, I cannot fully know my customer. That's a really important element in continuous discovery. And so what I really encourage teams to do in every single interview is to really search for what makes this customer unique, what's surprising to me in this interview, and how do you come in with that beginner's mind every single time? 
And this be prepared to be wrong phrase comes from um, decisive Chip and Dan Heath's book that summarizes decision-making research. And I strongly recommend reading that book right after you read mine. Um, it is one of the best books for product people because a lot of the work that we do is decision-making. And you're going to see a lot of the ideas from decisive show up in continuous discovery habits. And that's because we really do have to be aware of how our brains interfere with our ability to make good decisions. And the more discovery we do, the more we're going to feel confident that we know what we're doing and we're going to start to fall prey to that curse of knowledge and confirmation bias. And so there's in the book, I, t I reference um, Carl Weck, who's an educational psychologist at the University of Michigan. He has this really beautiful definition of wisdom that I think is really um, appropriate for product teams to keep in mind. And that wisdom is balancing confidence in what you know so that you can act and move forward with doubting what you know so that you keep this open mind and come in with this beginner's mindset so that you're always questioning what you know and you're always looking for where is there a gap between what you think and what your customer thinks. Thanks for that. That was super insightful. Uh, I'm going to pick some questions now from the YouTube chat. Uh, it's very interesting because there are a lot of questions about how to deal with management. So please bear with us while, yep. while we pick these up. Um, so Leticia is asking, how do you convince top managers that, uh, you know, people from engineering need, need to take time for discovery? How does that work? Yeah, so I'm going to go back to literally start with one 20 minute customer conversation a week. Yeah. And if you're getting pushback on an engineer joining a 20 minute customer conversation, I, I find that hard to believe. I really do, right? Like, I help you. Like, is that, Just quit, like, right? Let's, let's, let's find something we can trade out, right? So like if you're doing an yeah. hour long bug management meeting, kill the bug yeah. management meeting, right? Yeah, yeah. Like 20 minutes with the customer is more valuable than that. So like if you Correct. have to horse trade, horse trade. Um, yeah. Like it, you really can start with a teeny tiny activity and it's going, if you do it consistently, it's going to have a huge impact, right? And then grow from there. Um, and really, again, don't have the ideological battle. Like don't start with, yeah. hey, leaders, our engineers need to be in discovery. No, they don't. You've always worked this way and it's been fine, right? Yeah. So what you need to do is find a teeny tiny thing you can get them involved with and then show the benefits of them being involved in that thing. And I know, okay, so let's, I want to expand this question a little bit because, um, Axel, if you're getting a lot of questions about managing up and, and influencing, I want to tell a personal story. Please. I, I worked at a startup where I was the only product manager. I was actually hired as the front end web developer. Um, even though I was, at that point, I was working as an interaction designer. It was early enough that finding interaction design, UX design roles, they didn't really exist on their own. And so I took a job as a front end developer knowing that I would also get to do the design work. And then over time, it was clear that I was really a product manager as well. And so this company had a VP of product, a CEO, no individual product managers, no individual designers. So the org structure was basically a CEO, a CTO, a bunch of engineers, a VP of product, and then me. And then I played a lot of roles. I did all our front end development. I did all of our design. And then you'll see with time, I also became their product manager. Here's how this worked out. Here's how product worked at this company. Nobody in the building talked to a customer. Nobody. Uh, our VP of product managed a spreadsheet of feature ideas, most of which came from our CEO or our CTO, and he just prioritized them. And then they got farmed out to engineers. Okay, I know a lot of you work in this environment. So what did I do? I started to talk to customers. Um, I started to look at like what are the problems that we could solve. Um, I started to come up with ideas. I started by just adding ideas to this spreadsheet, right? I didn't say, hey, I talked to customers. Here's why my idea is better. I just started adding ideas to the spreadsheet. Over time, I, I still worked on the ideas that had no validation whatsoever, that just came from somebody's random idea, but I worked to get my ideas in there. Um, over time, some of my ideas got picked. And I continued to do the discovery to make sure those ideas were good. I continued to do the discovery on other people's ideas, right? So if I took something from that, if I was given something from that spreadsheet and it was like random CEO's idea, I still talked to customers about it. I still worked to make that idea as good as it could be. And what happened with time is people started to get curious about how I worked, right? 
my boss started to see, oh, Teresa actually can take a line from a spreadsheet and turn it into a good feature. How is this happening? Let's bring Teresa earlier into the process. And I actually became a product manager at that company, right? Because they realized we want Teresa earlier in the process. So again, I didn't try to change the way my boss worked, the VP of product. I didn't try to change the way our CEO worked. I just started to do discovery, had an impact, and then people got curious about how I worked. That's super interesting. And I think, you know, I guess there is in a lot of these companies when you, um, you are in the product trios and you're like literally in the trenches every day, sometimes it feels like, you know, you're fighting this big beast. And I think more often than not, maybe we put ourselves in this, you know, confrontation uh, kind of situation with the leadership or, you know, managers, et cetera, where what I'm hearing from this is how can you influence and what can you do on your own level uh, that can change the way, you know, the, your work is perceived by the rest of the team in such a way that, you know, people will want to bring you, like, like you said, earlier in the process and things like that. I now, think that was really interesting. Now, I will say in that particular story, we were a consumer company. It was really easy yeah. for me to find customers to talk to. I have done the exact same thing in a B2B business, right? So in a B2B business, if you don't have customers in your own personal network, you need to find a salesperson to become friends with or an account manager to become friends with <laughs> or a support person to become friends with, right? But don't turn it into the ideological battle. Don't go to your head of sales and say, I need to be in on all your sales calls. Find a single sales rep that you can go have lunch with and build a relationship with and get in on some of their calls, right? So Correct. again, this continuous habit building, start teeny tiny. Don't try to boil the ocean. What's the easiest first step that you can take so that next week looks a little bit better than last week? Brilliant. Um, last question from me about something I also read in the book in chapter 11, um, and then I'll pass on to, to Chloe. Um, so chapter 11 is about measuring impact and you open with a story, uh, at after college where you were trying to learn more about the job search experience of seniors studying. And you give this example of how you ran a series of, I would say low cost tests mm -hmm. and how you leverage existing data before even trying to build this machine learning algorithm that would automatically match students with relevant jobs in relevant locations. Right. Um, and in the same chapter, you also mentioned that there is no point in measuring everything and that it's better to take a step back and think about, you know, the evaluation criteria that will help measure the impact of the desired outcome. And this to me, when I heard this story, it's kind of like I had all the, of these flashes from past experiences where we were just obsessed with tracking everything and getting, you know, all these things right. Um, and I guess my question would be, what would you say to the product trio members out there that are trying to scope out every event that needs to be tracked with perfect taxonomies and properties and all this stuff, right? And just like focusing 99.9% .9 of their energy in the solution space, because that's the conversations that we, that, that, that's the critical mass of the conversations we have around the, around the company. What kind, of, what kind of advice would you give to these people? Yeah, so first of all, the principle in this chapter is that there's lots of interesting data that you're going to get lost in. There's very little actionable data. And so the key is to focus on the actionable data, right? The way to do this is you have to start with your customer. What is your customer trying to do? And this is where this idea of like a customer journey map can be really helpful. Although mm -hmm. people confuse customer journey maps. They think about it as the customer's journey with your product. So I like to use the, um, I use the experience map language instead because I want to understand the customer's experience independent of my product. My product might show up in the experience, but I want to go broader than that. So in this story in chapter 11, where I talk about my experience working at a company where we tried to help new college grads find their first job out of college, it's less about how do we optimize their workflow on our product, and it's more how do we get the big picture view of what's the experience of a college senior trying to find their first job, and shifting from optimizing the product to really understanding the customer's experience led to this really powerful insight in that our product mental model just didn't work for them. And our mental model was the same as everybody else's in the industry, which may, means there were no job boards that worked for college students. And it really unlocked this really powerful insight that allowed us to differentiate. It also put us in a position where the things that we had to measure were significantly harder than if we just wanted to optimize our product, 
right? Mm -hmm. And that's fine. We can't be afraid of hard things. If we really want to build a moat and differentiate ourselves, we got to tackle those hard problems. And so I think the key is to start with what's the customer's experience and when do they have success? And how do you layer your metrics onto their success so that your company is successful when your customer is successful? Awesome, Perfect. thanks. Very true. One, one last question I would say that I had is uh, back, back at my time at Mano Mano, I tried to have strong connection with the data science kind of department. Um, how would you integrate them in this product trio? Yeah, it really depends on the company and the, and the team. So I think data scientists, user researchers, product marketing managers, all these other roles that, that may or may not be part of your scrum team, hmm. I'm not, they are important in this process, right? Here's the key with the idea of a trio. We want the right cross-functional roles represented for the appropriate decisions. So when we're talking about building digital products, we know from experience that a product manager, a designer, and a software engineer need to be involved in the vast majority of decisions, which sure. is why we talk about this trio-based model. Yeah. But if you're working, if you're doing discovery on how to bring a product to market, you're probably integrating your product marketing manager in the discovery for that work because that's their expertise, right? Mm. If you work on a data-heavy product, on a product that needs a lot of data science, you might have a quad that person might need to be involved in every single discovery decision. Mm. Now here's the, mis and then same with, if you have the luxury of having an embedded user researcher on your team, you probably want them to be in your quad, right? Here's the mistake though, don't include everybody in every decision mm. because you'll slow way down, right? So think about the trio is, what's the minimum that we need so that the appropriate cross-functional roles are represented so we can make the best decision that we can. And the reason why we're focusing on the minimum is we still want to move fast. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. That was super insightful. Um, a few words, I guess, before uh, we wrap up. Um, we've got uh, just over uh, two minutes left. Um, the book is available uh, now, right? So I know I bought my copy on Amazon. I think there's a, a Kindle version available and uh, the uh, hard copy is also available on Amazon. Uh, anything else you want to say about the book, the release of the book? Yeah, so it's available in paperback and Kindle and EPUB. So on Amazon, on Amazon properties around the world, it's available on um, paperback and Kindle. I have received some reports from folks in India that the paperback is not always available. I'm, I'm not sure if that's a problem with um, Amazon's print on demand partner. It should be available in paperback on every Amazon property around the world. It's also available through other book retailers, both in paperback and EPUB. Um, if you're not seeing it at your favorite bookstore, um, sometimes it takes a little bit of time for it to propagate. You can also request it. Um, it's available through Ingram Spark on print on demand, which means any bookstore in the world can request it through Ingram Spark. So if your favorite retailer doesn't have it, you can send them an email and say, hey, I want this book and it should become available. Um, a lot of people have asked me about an audio version. It is coming. Uh, we have not Amazing. Even, we have not even okay. started the process yet, so I don't have a timeline yet. Um, and that's because I'm having... People want a roadmap. Give yeah, us the roadmap. I know. So, <laughs> yes. Maybe less than five years. <laughs> yes. I, I can commit. It is coming, but it's not yet. I don't have a timeline yet. As soon as I do, I will share the details of that. Um, the other thing that I will share about this book, there's a, there's a lot. It was designed to be a how-to guide, but I know for a lot of people, it is hard to put a book into practice. So one of the things that we are doing with the release of the book is we are launching a membership community where you can connect with like-minded peers. We're gonna do a ton of stuff in this community to help you put the book into practice. Every month we're interviewing people that are working this way, getting into the nitty gritty of, for example, how they automated the, the um, uh, recruiting process, what tools they're using to run assumption tests. So you can get a lot of great examples of how to actually put this into practice. You can learn more about that at producttalk.org. Um, we also have a whole bunch of courses to help you build skills in all these different areas. Um, you can also learn more about that at producttalk.org. So just know as you read the book, you're not on your own as you put it into practice. Brilliant. That was amazing. Um, let, me, let me thank you for taking the time to do this. Thank you again, and congratulations on the release of the book. It's a really great book. I would recommend it with, without hesitation to any product manager uh, around me. It's really well written, and it's very 
I have to say it's super concrete. Uh, and I think, you know, like you said, I think a lot of people might feel it's hard to go from the book into practice, but I do feel if you have some experience and have been wanting to kind of embed continuous product discovery in your organization, this book is definitely going to take you uh, uh, further on that journey. So thank you so much for your work. Chloe, thanks so much for uh, co-hosting with me tonight. That was super, super, su super exciting. Thanks, thanks, yeah. thanks for thanks taking the time. Me, really appreciate it. Awesome. And thank you for everyone that's, uh, everybody that's connected uh, around the world. Thanks for listening. And yeah, see you soon on Product with Panache. Thanks again, Teresa. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Our pleasure. Thanks. Bye.